through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 203. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Lincoln, yes. we're going to be talking about Steven Spielberg. Yes. We've talked about his films a lot in the past. Mm -hmm. No surprise there. Yeah. Perhaps the greatest director ever, depending on who you ask. Yeah. Certainly in the conversation. Uh, probably one of the easiest lists to make of uh, what we would talk about. I would Actually, say. I would say the exact opposite. You say the hard because you're trying to whittle away. Totally. I, th okay. I, I mean, there's so many films like Empire of the Sun. I would love to okay. talk me some Empire of the Fair Sun, enough. but it was just sort of like, oh, uh, we can't talk that one. And there's stuff like Minority Report, which okay. we bumped because yeah, yeah. we've already talked that about that it's so true. many times. Okay. And yeah, I more I, mean, our, how about an initial list of uh, of uh, topics? There's there's so Either many way, to choose from. Great director. Again, this is one of those times, much like Tom Hanks, where yeah. we we had to whittle it down to a small list. So if there's something else you want to talk about, put it in the comments. We'd love to Please. generate a discussion mm -hmm. there. But we would spend. I don't know, 10 <laughs> hours talking about Steven Spielberg yeah. if we went through everything yeah, he's been involved with. And again, we're just talking about the things he has directed, yes. not produced, because that's an even longer, oh my God. incredible list. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why the dude is like one of the richest filmmakers uh -huh. ever. So Yeah. We try to stick just to director Spielberg for this yes. segment. And again, you know, the dude has been, I mean, prolific in terms of what he's done. He's been... He's had projects nominated for Best Picture, you know, mm -hmm. handfuls of times. He's been nominated for Best Director at least a, a several handfuls of times, you know. Sometimes even, you know. In the same year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, I don't know if he's been in the same year, but he's had a lot of uh, hmm. Best Picture and Best Director nominations nice. in the same year. So, needless to say, he's sadly only won one of those. Really? One Best Director, and I think he's actually only won Best Picture once though sometimes he's been uh nominated for best picture uh -huh. but he wasn't a producer on the project so he didn't really get a just that whole producers get best picture gotcha. and stuff so it's that weird that works? hollywood okay. stuff yeah huh. that's why uh you got to be a producer to get that co-op on stage anyway we're gonna start one of the most obvious pla obvious yeah. places to start jaws mm -hmm. we're talking 1975 here this yes. is the peter benchley classic mm -hmm. about a shark I don't know what you want to say, gone rogue uh, on a small little yeah. island. Shark getting a taste of the man. Yes. Uh, Amity in, I think it's the it was, northeast. Yeah, say, it was Martha's Vineyard is where okay. it was actually okay. filmed. Yeah. So there you go. Peter Benchley, by the way, kicked off the set. Was he really? at the Because he protested the climax of the film. So they just kicked him the hell off. The uh, set. I, th I think Peter Benchley owes... Steven Spielberg a lot. I'm not going to even say what he should be doing, because this is a family-friendly podcast, but if you've ever seen any of Peter Benchley's other stuff, it's kind of boring. Like, I saw The Beast. Mm. But, I mean, granted, it was a TV movie, but I was like, this feels like a really vanilla version of, like, uh, Jaws, or basically all his stuff is essentially, like, toned-down versions of, like, Sharktopus versus, uh, like, Alligator gotcha. Piranha or something. Yeah, I mean, you know, how many times have people been kicked off sets? I just think it's funny. Yeah. Anyway, you know, he's got a little cachet to him. Mm -hmm. But this is the story of, you know, a couple guys who set out to kill a shark by yes, themselves. Yes, terrorizing people. Roy Scheider, uh, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfuss. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, I guess, th gave the classic line, you know, we'll make you afraid to go into the water. Yeah. And, I I mean, I grew up way after this oh, yeah, came out. Oh, yeah, clearly. Both but even still, it's 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 so well done. Oh, like, yeah. Even to I this mean, day, it so holds up. Point of, point of view from a shark swimming up on, below someone who hasn't... <clears throat> Excuse me. Who hasn't thought of that? Or but this is also out? this is also takes advantage of the concept of like it's what you don't see exactly. that makes it scary. Yeah. Like it really even to the end, it's like the last I don't know ten minutes where you really yeah. see the full on shark. You know, and it's out. and it's it's one of those things that's like it just came together so perfectly because you know Jaws is there's been so much behind the scenes making of talking about yeah, Jaws because of how popular it is. That, yeah, yeah. And, and so. Oh, interestingly enough, a lot of the being not seen was because the shark was having so much problems and being so problematic. But Steven Spielberg, you know, he really early showed his chops as a good director because he took what he had and he made it into something that I think was way better. And yeah, I, I think if the shark had been appearing much earlier, it would have been or just more. You know, in general, yeah. yeah. I, th I, th I think, you know, that sense of like you don't know what's out there, like when yeah. the buoys are getting sucked mm -hmm. under and stuff like yeah. that. That's if you think about horror films, like that's still exactly. some of the best horror work yes. 
to this day. I and, mean, and what makes horror scary is people thinking about those things to make them frightening. And sometimes I, I can just imagine Spielberg being like, well, we can't have the shark go by and pull him under. So what else could we do? It's funny to think about also in the sense that, you know, Steven Spielberg, as of now, Mm -hmm. you think largely sort of like blockbuster, cheery kind of feet. Interesting that you use the term blockbuster because this movie, when it was originally released in the summer of 75, over 67 million Americans went and saw it and made it the first summer blockbuster yeah it created the term Mm -hmm. yeah for sure and it's but he's he's known for sort of big spectacle films but you know i I mean i guess it's sort of a spectacle spectacle ish film but it really doesn't feel that way it feels fairly small it's much more of a horror film if if you actually think about it and it really you don't think of steven spielberg well he didn't do that i know (laughs) but uh you you don't think of steven spielberg as sort of like a horror film director necessarily but like some of his best stuff is sort of like off of the um, cheery film mm, path. Yes, you know, Saving yes. Private Ryan, which we're not going to talk about today yeah. because we've talked about it so many times. Like yes. stuff like that that are stand out so much. There's several other that we'll mention, but you know that aren't necessarily summer blockbusters yeah. per se. And yet that's some of his best stuff as well. So. I also think it's interesting that this was the first movie to reach the coveted 100 million dollar mark. Really, in the first? theatrical okay. rentals. Specifically, which is a which was about forty five percent of the box office gross. And we're assuming we're not doing like adjusted gross for something. It was like considered more. the highest gross film of all time until Star Wars, which I mean was only four years later. We're not we're like we're not a uh, what's that uh um that uh in, the domestic gross inflation. Yeah, no, what's that one about the wet uh, in the south? Um, Gone with the wind. Oh yeah. So we're not we're not including like inflation or something because even still like they always argue that. Well, that inflation. was more theatrical views. This is okay. talking about rentals. Okay. So this so, is saying as far as rentals, gotcha. it, it it actually pushed the movie into a hundred million based on forty five percent of it was just theatrical rentals. People renting it. It was very. It was right in that home video cusp. Highly rented. I guess pretty so. interesting. So interesting. Um, Want to note that this was nominated for Best Picture. Oh, wow. Uh, lost to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Ooh. Ooh. Hard. Which, I'm not going to say One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a bad film, but here's my argument for Jaws. Okay. That if you look back at the films retroactively, Which and obviously you can't, can't. do it at the yeah. time, <laughs> but if you look for back at them retroactively, and this is the whole argument for the 2020 awards. Ah, uh, yes. Which one do you think made a bigger impression on film well, and society? Well, that one's I mean, obvious now, I mean, in retrospect. Jack but... Nicholson was good in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and the book was, was good. The book's but amazing. But really, what can you tell me so much about it? Like About the film? Yeah. like it's. It, do you really want me to no, see I, Spielberg's I'm just, time I'm just, talking about how good One Flew Over the Cuckoo's I'm Nest just, is? I'm just after? talking about like how much more memorable Well, yeah, but Jaws. that's that's not how you pick Best Picture. You don't piss, I think pick you on long term. But how can you know when some movies come out in oh, January? That's why you should do the 2020 awards. Yeah, but that is irrelevant to the yearly Best Picture awards. I'm just saying they should just stop for 20 years and then start the Academy Awards. I can totally understand as far as an overall well-rounded movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, receiving a Best Picture award. I think think it's a very well-rounded movie, but I think... I think Jaws is a better movie. I think it I was say better it, it crafted. I didn't say it wasn't a better movie. I'm so. still saying I think the right one was picked for Best Picture. I think you're wrong. <laughs> we'll leave it at that, though. All right. Moving right along, we're going to jump a couple years forward. Mm-hmm. Again, another sort of classic, bringing back um, Richard Dreyfuss yes. for Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yep. Interesting alien movie. And I say that because I was thinking about this. In terms of most alien movies... Mm. Aliens are sort of villains. Mm, they really aren't often sort of like benevolent, positive, benevolent or, yeah. creatures. And I think this is one of the ones that influenced the sort of concept of friendly uh, aliens. Do you think, you know, into the past, you could even go... Um, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers style. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of more of a Russian allegory and communism, yeah. whatever. But you think about that kind of stuff, and mm-hmm. that is general, you know, yeah. the ants that yeah, come from fe- outer it's space. It's usually fear. Yeah. Some, some element of communal fear that you may turn into aliens and to be fair you know steve even stephen hawking has said you know if aliens actually do come they're probably not going to be benevolent creatures (laughs) but this is one of sort of the interesting ones that was sort of like you know maybe they aren't like what what happens if they aren't it's just sort of like the fixation of the Mm. characters like richard dreyfus in this film of like you know the experience of uh 
an alien encounter and what it yes. drives you to and how it affects you and and what that does to your life yeah. and i mean it's not necessarily positive things no. i mean you could argue it is i, I mean it dissolves his family yeah I, mean. I think it's interesting that this is one of those movies that where the alien i mean seeing the aliens themselves is kind of a payoff but it's not yeah. i wouldn't say it's the it's the focal point of the movie no which i think is an interesting thing is a lot of times in I mean, up to this point alien movies were about the alien being this like you said sure. this menace so having this benevolent thing that just kind of at its existence guides a person in a specific path was a much more interesting path to take well i think there's a whole bunch of interesting paths too because you have like the government and mm, how they yeah. handle it you have like richard dreyfus mm -hmm. and um francis Truffaut. Fr francois <laughs> Truffaut, <laughs> yeah from director of the foreigner blows yep. as an actor Amazing, this. Uh, and but like wave. you have his sort of like tracking of the aliens richard mm -hmm. dreyfus is kind of like experience it but mm -hmm. he's not really he, he has this mental picture yeah. of this mountain he doesn't really know it until he sees it he's like oh i'm going there and so you have a bunch of different these sort of stories simultaneously yeah. going on it's really just sort of an interesting build to that end with the payoff yeah. of the aliens it's interesting because Considering how much visuals this movie uses, or how much the visuals in this movie are, are like you know memorable, there's some of the things that we think about this movie. We think about the mashed potato mountain. We sure. think about seeing the original mountain behind it. You know the alien encounter, special. But this film holds the record for the most cinematographers on a production. Really, it had eleven. Wow, counting the special edition. Oh. It won the Academy Award for Best Cinematography, so mm -hmm. I would hope it would. Uh, yeah, so all those guys got awards. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> um, I think actually only one guy got award. At least they have only one credited uh, cinematographer, yeah. Vilmos Zygmunt. Hmm. Um, Steven Spielberg was uh, nominated for Best Director, though. Awesome. You lost to Woody Allen for Annie Hall, mm. which... Which you're not a Woody Allen I'm not, fan. I'm not going to... You're not a hater, I'm but not you're a not hater. a fan. I'm not, so I'm not a huge enthusiast. But also, like, again, you know, you think back, it was sort of like the amount of directing mm. that's necessary. Maybe there's more character but direction Woody in Allen him. is also in Annie Hall. He's one of the main characters. So I think if it's director nod, you're directing an amazing film that you're also starring in, I think that might be a little bit more complicated and hard than being one dude directing 11 But at the same time, you could argue that, well, <laughs> you could argue that this one had, like, visual effects and all sorts yeah. of stuff that you have to deal with as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think... I think there's something to be said. You know, Annie Hall is a good film. I'm not gonna, I'm not mm, gonna say mm -hmm. Annie Hall is a bad film, but it just feels like... Annie Hall is a much... I mean, you, you make a good point about him having to direct mm -hmm. with himself being involved, but it feels like, ultimately, a much simpler project... And but do we compare films upon their on uh, their grandioseness and their level of budget as far as quality? Do we look at I mean, uh, maybe you know. maybe not maybe not in terms of something like best picture you're just oh. looking for the best film but in terms of best director mm -hmm. I feel like you're talking about you know having to balance all these complex equations and I feel like maybe having less there to work with is harder. Maybe we'll I don't. Think I feel so, like though. you could almost come up with. I, I, don't I, th think I think so. you need to make an entirely separate segment in your audio podcast that's just called "Why Spencer Disagrees with the Oscars." Probably. And you just go year through year, every award, and just talk about what right, else. Let's you thought do that. All right, say. I'll do that. I'll do that. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, th I think I think both of them are good. I just again, I, I'm not saying necessarily that the film is the best picture of the mm -hmm. year, but I feel like. If that is who won Best yeah. Director, I feel like Spielberg has at least as good an argument and I can of why he won that. it. And don't get me wrong, I in no way am trying to defend the Oscars. However, I think yes. uh, looking at all of their decisions in hindsight and looking looking down on them feeling superior is probably something that we shouldn't do. I feel like I have a much stronger argument for the next one, though. <laughs> okay. When we move on to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. Okay. This is the obvious beginning of the Indiana Jones yes. franchise. We're talking about the great... Uh, historian, mm -hmm. uh, teacher, archaeologist. Yes, yes, archaeologist. Who, I mean, this is the beginning of the franchise. This sets the tone. I would argue, uh, I, I, I have a hard time saying, saying it's your favorite indie. No, saying oh. it's not my favorite indie. Okay. Like, I like Last Crusade a lot, and I even like Temple of Doom a lot. Okay. But I have a hard time putting either of them above this one. I it think is Last, pretty amazing. I think Last Crusade is great, but I think this one might be. A more tight and tired no, project. Agree. Last Crusade is is so good because it is a sequel that is so good. 
And I think it's good opinion. because of Sean Connery. No, I, I agree, but I'm saying part of what makes it so pe that people remember it so much is that it was like a se you know a sequel that came out that wasn't worse than the original. It sure. wasn't like Rambo one and then the rest of yeah. Rambo. And I think because of the second one being a little bit of a dip, people were excited yeah, that it came which, back. Again, always blows my mind. And I that think Temple of Doom was prequel. Sean Connery is probably a perfect person to put as sort of the father of Harrison yeah. Ford. But but Raiders, I mean, it's. I think Karen Allen was the better. Love interest. Of it the whole it series. blows my mind that Ra Raiders. I think you have a much stronger argument than you do in the way of Jaws at looking back on it and saying well, they should have got well, a lot more. Well, I was going to say, you know, not only that, uh, Karen Allen is a strong female mm -hmm. lead. I thought that was great. Uh, you know, it was nominated for Best Picture, lost to Chariots of Fire. I, I mean, again, I like Chariots of Fire just I fine. I think I know what movie that is. Too young. Running, move. Okay. Running, running film about you know whatever. Uh, but I, I, I think. <laughs> Again, you know, there's such profound um, brilliance in the making of Raiders of the Lost yes. Ark. It's one of those films I like. I like Chariots of Fire, but I have a hard time yes. thinking about it in terms of Indiana Jones. And especially, even even just, I mean, both of them together, you know, I think I probably prefer Indiana Jones mm. or Raiders of the Lost Ark. But even thinking back retroactively 20 years, like, yeah. it's such a well-produced film. Even to this day, oh, yeah. it still holds up yeah. so well. And, you know, it's crazy that we think about it because this is Lucas and Spielberg working mm -hmm. together. And, you know, first off... And Lawrence Cash. Despite the too. fact that the two of them were working together and that seems, like, so iconic now... Uh, it was initially turned down by every studio in Hollywood. Wow. And af only after a lot of persuading did Paramount end up agreeing to do it. Wow, that's crazy. And on the flip side of that, uh, Spielberg is quoted as saying, I made it as a B-movie. I didn't see the film as anything more than a better made version of the Republic serials. Well, that's, I mean, it totally, I that's it totally is. It is it I mean, it's so really, it is serial. And I feel like... But I think but, that I think that attitude going into something and being like, look, I'm not trying to act like this hasn't been done before. I'm not trying to act like I have the most creative idea that's ever come no. out. I'm taking something that's existed before. I'm just making a a, a more well put together version. But I also think that's sort of like one of the things that was the downfall of the Crystal Skull is the yeah. sort of like jump forward time period and he sort of tried to move it along yeah. and sort of mem memorable to the things that were a period of was it the 50s or something yeah, they were so, trying yeah. to compare it to, and it just it did didn't work and no. serve that guys everyone wanted sort of the classic yep. indie movie and that's not what it was yep but you know Ford was too old I, I let me throw this out there Steven Spielberg was nominated for best director for this as okay. well but he lost to Warren Beatty for Reds I would like to see you bring someone up who was a heard of Reds yeah seen Reds and likes Reds more than Raiders of the Lost Ark <laughs> like any of those like or let's just uh, any of those people who uh, you know who like have seen or have heard of who have not heard of Indiana Jones. Oh, I mean, that's definitely, that's... No, there's no doubt about that. But I just, I would love to see someone who's a big advocate for yeah. Reds write in and explain yeah. why you think that he deserved director. Yeah. I mean, it, granted, he was acting in that as well or something like that, maybe. But it's just like... But yeah, this is one of those ones, I like I said, it was just so, all the, all the work that they did, and considering how we look at it back at it in retrospect, as if it was something that the studios just gave them everything they wanted, yeah. and they made this amazing film. Now, they probably fought relatively tooth and nail for a lot of it, and made and, an amazing film. Yeah, made a ton of money, and yep. uh, Joe Johnson won an Academy Award for visual effects on yes. this one, so good on him for that. Good old Joe Johnson. Jumping just a smidge forward yeah. to 82, we're going to talk about E.T., the extraterrestrial. Speaking this, of alien, benevolent aliens again. Yep, look at that. Exactly. Uh, again, you know, this is one of those ones that you kind of almost have to talk about when you talk about Steven oh, yeah. Spielberg, especially for me. I mean, this is probably... When you're talking about getting in the family-friendly Spain, this is clearly well, where you end up with Steven Spielberg. I mean, you think about people who grew up in the 80s, yeah. there's a handful of films you think about, and Spielberg almost always has mm -hmm. his hand in all of them. You know, Indiana Jones. Yep. You think... Um, I mean, you could argue Star Wars, but that I, I don't think I really was cognizant of Star Wars until mm. probably the late 80s. Probably Indiana Jones, too, to be fair. But E.T., yep. Goonies, I mm -hmm. mean, there's films like that that really helped define the era for me. John Hughes has a lot of them, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but definitely. E.T., the extraterrestrial, was one of those just amazing products, especially because it's sort of like done with essentially nobody. In yeah. It. Like, it was not... You know, Richard Dreyfuss yeah. in Close Encounters. Yeah. You think about the cast, it's D. Wallace, who was, I mean, decently known at that mm -hmm. point, but not like... Not like blockbuster huge, name, you know, right. bringing it in. Henry Thomas was unknown. Yeah. Drew Barrymore was her first real role, mm -hmm. like, and she was a child. Like, none of these people are, like, household names are yeah. selling or... Let me see. Now these people are going to sell, like, a 300 a million... Yeah, these, yeah. These are not marquee names, per se, and so... 
to put the, this film together about an alien is almost a bold decision. And that shows yeah. you how much weight Steven Spielberg had at this point. And again, again granted, it only cost about $10 million to wow. make, but it almost made $800 million. This has got to be one of the best. Yeah, I think it's still up there. I think it's like fourth. Or for in the top it. ten at least of it's up top, there. top grossing, and you know again you know nominated for best picture mm -hmm. lost to Gandhi, nominated okay. for best director lost to Richard Attenborough for Gandhi. Yeah, and it's it's who comes back later? Oh, he does. He does come <laughs> back in a very interesting way. Uh -huh. But you know I again you know I I like Gandhi, but in terms of the impact on the film world, mm. I think you'd be hard pressed to say there are people who. Think or there's a wider audience mm. in or a bigger influence from Gandhi I than there is ET. Like there's yeah. so much uh, parody of ET. But you know, there it, not to not to decry ET in any way. But Gandhi and ET are definitely directed towards two different age groups. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And related to that, I bet people who were not children and older and maybe Gandhi had more relevance to would care more about it than a younger generation being affected by E.T. I think it's also sort of just that like A, you know, the Academy is not apt to give children's films true. awards. And B, yeah. they generally... Pixar's making them rethink that a lot. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully they are. They seem to be shutting them down still from getting like you know, final. I think they finally just started getting nominated for best picture mm -hmm. with the ten awards or whatever, but or ten nominees or whatever. Mm. But you know, also generally the Oscars don't usually reward populist fare, and sure. this is a film that made eight hundred million dollars. Yes, like I think it was finally with the Dark Knight where people are like, okay, we're fucking get this together. Yeah. I mean, obviously there are exceptions, you know, Titanic, mm -hmm. uh, Lord of the Rings, yes. the King, but for the most part, stuff like English Patient or Shakespeare yeah. in Love that are winning or the that, artist or the artist, not that, to cry the artist. No, not not saying any of them, not judging quality on any of yes. them, but I feel like sometimes there's a bit of a backlash against yeah. things that are really popular yeah, amongst agreed. audiences. Definitely. So you're not going to see Transformers winning awards because... Well, that's not about it being popular. No, it's Spencer. not. <laughs> it's not. I'll, I'll acknowledge that, Something but Something I never thought about in E.T., because I you know, haven't gone back and watched it and looked, thought about this, but now it's... I, all I can see is this fact, is that most of the film was shot height-wise at the eye level of a child to further mm. connect pe uh, people with Elliot and E.T., which is just like I think back on it now, it's like yeah, everything was like armchairs were at like tops of frames yeah, and true. stuff. But it's just one of those things you don't think about, but no. visually in your head, you're making all those connections. That's whether or not you yeah. connect it. I also want to note that uh, John Williams won the Academy oh, yeah. for the score again, so memorable. And not only that, but he was the composer for all the films we've talked about thus yes. far, and also won for Jaws as yes. well. Yes, uh, John Williams actually, if I remember correctly, um, he wrote part of the score live and Luke uh, Spielberg edited based on what he had given the film the ending differently based on it because he just showed him the ending and he was like just orchestrate an orchestra don't write something first orchestrate an orchestra what you would do with this while it was playing and then he retweaked the edits to make it look better such a good composer it's just yeah. incredible also interesting that the m most of the full body puppetry of E.T. was done with a two foot ten inches tall stuntman or it's like R two D two, but the scenes in the kitchen, excuse me, not or were done with a ten year old boy who was born without legs, but was an expert walking on his hands. Wow, hmm. interesting. Also, did you ever realize that E T was not a male or a female? He was I supposed to be really a plant like creature that had about no it, gender, I mean, according to Spielberg. Mm, Who knew? I don't know. Oh. Grew up with it, never thought about it. Glad Spielberg was smart enough to rectify the walkie-talkie gun oh my, situation, yes. too. Thank you for yes. doing that. George Lucas, follow his advice. Please do. Moving right along, we're going to jump to the 90s and the return of Richard Attenborough. Yep. This time as an actor yep. in Jurassic Park. Yep. We're talking it, the Michael Crichton-based mm -hmm. book. About the dinosaurs. Yes. Dinosaur. <laughs> Dino DNA. Secret movie night one. Exactly, that's right. I just Good like memory. The, I, I, thank you. I just like the fact that, you know, he lost a best director for Gandhi with Richard Attenborough's director, and then he directed Richard Attenborough in Jurassic Park, of which he won what best he didn't, he didn't he didn't oh, win either no, of those oh, okay same year though, though same year we'll get to that okay. oh, we'll get to that okay but yeah this that's an even more interesting yes. whole thing <laughs> this is the story of dinosaurs how can you go wrong with that this is a dude who's tackled like uh giant mm -hmm. horrific creatures like jaws yep. he's tackled aliens yep. now he's tackling dinosaurs yep. and i was thinking about this before we did this list and this might be the first time i ever read a book in anticipation of a movie i was yes. in fifth grade when this was coming out and i remember we we're either reading part of 
it in class mm -hmm. or we were reading the whole thing in well, class. Well, that's what's so interestingly relevant. I always thought about that because I, I did too. I read it before it came out kind of thing or anticipation of it coming out. And I always thought that that was just maybe really, really good timing on, on my family's part or how mm -hmm. I got connected to the book. I didn't realize that it was so hyped as a book before it was even done, mm -hmm. just based on its idea. Because first off, Crichton was paid by Universal $2 million for the rights of the novel before it was published. Wow. Before it was published. And it was published in 90. However, pre-production of the film began in 89 using only Crichton's manuscript. Wow. It was widely believed that the book would be such a hit that it would make an outstanding movie, which obviously was correct. But can you believe that? Like, you have not even finished a book and people are making a movie out of your manuscript. Oh, it's also one of those things that, like, the manuscript or the book was really weird compared to the movie. Like, oh, there's totally. great sequences, there's great stuff that was taken out, no yeah. doubt. But there's also, like, pages of zeros and ones. Like, yeah, yes, like that's data. right. I like, forgot about that. Yes. And it's sort of like, what the fuck yeah, are you doing? Yeah, all the visual but, stuff yeah, like, that was put in. But yeah. it's like, why would you even include yeah. this, Michael Cran? This is kind of like <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, so sifting through that and making a great film, it's then ironic that, you know, they go and make the next one, which Michael yes. Cran writes to be a movie, which is almost like a script. Yes. And they don't even do it. Yeah. Like, basically, yeah, you did. No. So, like, whatever, yeah. Just <laughs> anyway, you know, Sam Neill as um, Dr. Grant is uh -huh. one of the best characters Bill Berg ever had. Yes. Uh, Ian Malcolm, great character as well. Don't really understand why you would go to him for the next one, but that's a whole other Michael Creighton related issue. <laughs> uh, you know, great cameos, you know, with Wayne Knight, uh -huh. B.D. Wong, Sam Samuel Jackson. Jackson. Yeah. Um, Film won a slew of visual effects awards. It won Best Sound, Best Effects, Best Visual Effects. Um Great, great yeah. film. I mean, what 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 else? I mean, we've showed it Secret Movie Night for a recent dress. Yeah. It's so iconic. No. Also, just like noting this because it's funny, one, my wife went to Secret Movie Night 1. She's terrified of dinosaurs. Yes. That's, that's how much she likes the MacGuffin. Perhaps we'll End this discuss that more extendedly in an audio <laughs> segment at some point. Because that deserves more yes, discussion. Yes, it does. I just like tossing that out there. But, you know, as you said, you know, 1993 friggin' prolific year yes. for him. And the 94 Academy Awards were good to him, not just because of Jurassic Park, yes. not just because of Richard Attenborough, yes. but he also did a film called Schindler's List, which was nominated for pretty much every other award yep. Jurassic Park was did not nominated yeah. for. Jurassic Park got all of the Lord of the Rings-esque special effect effects and sound and cinematography and then all the, like, Best Picture Actor, all well, that no, stuff. No, no, no. All just the visual ones with Jurassic Park. Oh, okay. This was like cinematography, oh, all okay, that sort okay. of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. And, um, yeah, Schindler's, Schindler's List. List. Pretty much the exact opposite direction of Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was sort of like a populist, sort of fun mm -hmm. film for yeah. the entire family. Everybody and, was looking forward to it because it was going to be so amazing and awesome and cool. And Schindler's List is sort of a passion project that was very art house, not yes. art house, artistic in terms mm -hmm. of like, you know, being black and white, yes. um, being Which very. Is the high, without adjusting for inflation, it's the highest grossing black and white film of all time. It's a really. A passion project. I mean, if you're familiar with yes. Steven Spielberg, is very interested in Jewish history, mm -hmm. especially during you know World War II and the concentration camps and Ra whatnot. Raiders of the Lost Ark. He put the line in um, that said, "I do not care for these Jewish customs," because he realized that the movie in no point showed how the Nazis hated Jews, and he wanted to make sure that was. It, it's a real. I mean, he's done all sorts of stuff related to this. I mean, it comes mm -hmm. back, you know, things like Munich, etc. Yeah, there's obviously. films. He, I think in Close Encounters, people said there was a lot of Christian allegories, and he's like, no, 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 I, I did not do any Christian allegories. They're purely coincidental. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it, the, the terrifying thing is that this film is based on reality. This yes. is the real story of you know a guy in Germany, a factory mm -hmm. uh, owner who, I mean, had this ability to save. A certain number of Jews yes. based upon the Them people working, working in his factory. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's a complicated thing. You're dealing with, like, the death, the persecution of the Jews. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with uh, guilt. You're dealing with, you know, saving. I mean, God, the Holocaust. What, you, what a, what a, what a loaded, um, deep, intrinsic time. But at the same time, also, you know, perhaps the only other one I can really think of, and there, I'm sure there are other ones, I'd love people to list them here in the comments, mm -hmm. is, you know, Life is Beautiful is obviously one you can think mm -hmm. of about the Holocaust, but this is probably one of the most um, intense yes. versions of the Holocaust that yes. has been portrayed in I would film. Agree. As far and as, yeah, as like, yeah. yeah. That is just the pure, like, mm -hmm. the 
the terror of it. I mean, I guess the Blind the Striped surprising. Pants, I guess, is another one. The striped Pajamas. That's why it's not surri surprising that he went on to do Saving Private Ryan and make the war aspect of the same, you know, era yeah, so true. realistic and one of the more realistic ever. Clearly, that era and time really matters to him. Well, that, which is one of the interesting things is that he decided to do it so artistic and do it in mm -hmm. black and white. And, I mean, that, it really... It, it, I mean, it's it's a very it's a venture, inter, very profound film. It's tough. It's tough to watch. I oh yeah, I don't know if I've watched it since the '90s because I, don't I had think so I much have trouble either. watching yeah. it. But you know, he won best picture for mm -hmm. it. He won best director mm -hmm. for it. Won best cinematography, best writing, best art direction, best editing, best music. John Williams. Um, Speak, was, speaking of art direction, uh, according to the art directors, no green paint or clothing was allowed on set mm. because the color would not show up well in the black and white film. Because I guess they paid a lot of special attention, uh, both in lighting and in paint, to and how it would appear on film, even if it looked weird in real life. So when mm -hmm. they were filming this all, it was probably like early on green screen dots, weird people trying to put probably, everything together. Yeah. But man, they don't, they sure don't show that they feel awkward about no, it. No, and I should note that uh, Liam Neeson was nominated for Best Actor, awesome. though he lost to Tom Hanks for Philadelphia. Oh yeah, That's, it's tough. Like yeah. you know, I, I like I like Liam Neeson. <laughs> Age drama. Nazis killing but Jews. That's, yeah, oh. that's tough. You know, that's that's a tough one. So I I, I tend to lean towards Tom Hanks, but mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah, it's not it's not because Liam Neeson was bad. Yes. Let's jump forward to the two thousands. We're yes. going to talk about Munich uh -huh. again, sort of in, inspired by uh, Truth. Yes. With uh, the was it the 70? aftermath of yep. Black September, the yes. Munich Olympics, where they mm -hmm. killed all those uh, Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, it was the Israeli response where they decided, you yes. know, we want to assassinate all the people involved. All, all the people involved, and they set out by getting a group of um, was it Mossad? Yeah, Mossad, Mossad agents. Mossad yeah. agents, though they disavow themselves mm -hmm. so that they can have plausible deniability. Classic. And you know, it's, it's was it Daniel Craig, Eric Bana. Mm -hmm. Syrian Hines, a couple other people yeah. who are sent on this mission of killing 11 yes. um, Muslim people. Mm -hmm. it's, Terrorists. It's it's interesting because, you know, it's, it is, um, it's a story about, you know, the fallout of this, much sort of like in a film like Argo, where yes. you think about the aftermath of an event. Mm -hmm. And... It, people dealing with stuff behind the scenes. You deal with, you know, sort of like the adventure aspect of trying to catch these people, the thriller, you know, trying mm -hmm. to kill them. Well, you're sort of got the emotional context of everything. Well, that, well, that's the whole thing, the morality of it. You yes. know, what is it? Is this justice to kill these mm -hmm. people in this manner? Is this? Are these the people that we're meant to kill? Are are we doing just the whole yeah. thing is really interesting and profound movie. I mean, yeah. As far as a movie that's that upon its initial plot element looks seems like it would be mostly an action thriller. It's actually very emotionally vested. Yeah, and I mean, I think the ending of it really puts in a very gray area where it's sort of like you know, the people involved mm -hmm. are not necessarily involved with the actual events that occurred yes. on Black September, and. But I they're mean, feeling this very real connection. Well, I mean, <laughs> and you're dying for it. I mean, yeah. several of the members of the team, not going to say who, mm -hmm. died during the process. And, yes. you know, they're, they're like, what's involved with collateral damage mm -hmm. and trying to kill these people and all these and sort of things. Clearly another pet project of yes, uh, Spielberg's. Absolutely. Not only because of the content and, uh, you know, how emotionally charged the film is. He doesn't tend to get into emotionally charged films on a whim. No. Um, but also the breakneck speed that they made this movie mm. in to make sure it could get uh, into the Oscars. Because mm. they the film crews called the shooting of this movie a race against the clock. Because in order to have it ready for Academy Awards... Uh, Spielberg and editor Michael Kahn had a specific editing schedule mm. in which the following three things happened. All scenes in Malta and Hungary were shot in 12 weeks and were edited on the spot. Wow. Each day Spielberg would review an edited scene shot two days earlier. So he was constantly editing and then, or they were editing and then reviewing it two days later. Uh, second, two copies of an edited scene were sent out, one to John Williams for music mm. and the other to Ben Burt for sound effects. So they literally, they were like, wow. just give them both out so they both have That's as much crazy. time as possible. And the last, uh, the Paris and New York scenes were edited two weeks after photography, and the final cut was ready after another two weeks. Wow. That's crazy speed for a Hollywood film. That's crazy speed. I mean, it paid <laughs> off. They were nominated for Best Picture. Uh, lost to Crash. I think you could really argue that one. I, I think a lot of people, you know, I think Crash kind of gets a bad rap. A lot of people I really shit on it's it. a piece of shit movie. But I mean, that's me. a lot of people feel that. I personally <laughs> think that this probably would be a better pick for Best Picture than Crash. But, I, I mean, 
No. Yeah. I've said that about almost every film. <laughs> every thing, list, so. pretty much. So, like, as far as Spencer is uh, concerned, who every now famous person should retroactively get Oscars for everything they did not recognize. Mostly just for. Steven Spielberg should get Oscars <laughs> for everything. But yeah, that's fair just, enough. That's uh, you did not get nominated for Best Director, though. Aww. And the film was financially a bomb. Really? It only made $112 million worldwide, theatrically. Cost seventy five million to make, wow. so it was not not a success when you ca- factor Sad. in advertising and all that sort of stuff. So. Probably uh, part of that breakneck speed is not having a much a much chance to market yep. it. And just an FYI, this is based on the book Vengeance: The True Story yes. of an Israeli Counter Terrorist Team by George Jonas. For those of you who want to actually mm-hmm. you know, get into that, he does he does a lot of uh, movies based on yes. books. So that's yes, kind of based one on good thing. reality. Yep, especially ET and Close Encounters, both based on first hand experience. Truth. Truth. By me. Yeah. <laughs> Truth. Truth. Believe it. <laughs> Brings us to this Friday, November 9th. We're talking Lincoln. Mm-hmm. This is the biopic. Mm-hmm. Biopic, however you yeah, want to pronounce never it. I remember which I think one I go with biopic. Yeah. That it sounds, makes more that, sense. That sounds more sense, but when I look at the word, I want to say biopic. Yeah. I don't know. But it's the story of on the wrong Abraham Lincoln. Yes. You know, we're talking Civil War. Daniel we're talking Lewis. Um, Abolition, mm, or slavery. emancipation, proclamations. That's right. It's based on the book by, let's see, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln, hmm. which she has written a lot of political books, a lot of books about president. In fact, she won the Pulitzer Prize for wow. No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, The American Home Front During World War II. Um, there have been some plagiarism allegations, though. Hmm. I don't know about that, but needless to say, this book, um, this film was began in some capacity pre-production before she even began the book. She had wow. worked with Spielberg in some capacity in 1999, and the book was even done till 2005. And they're wow. like, "Okay, we're doing this as a movie." They're like, "You lady, you know what you're talking about. Let's talk this yeah. out. Let's do it." Very knowledgeable uh, historian. Yes, clearly. We got uh, Steven Spielberg. Great director. Yeah, clearly have, willing to do good histor- historian work. You have Daniel Day-Lewis as Abraham Lincoln. Great yeah. choice. Actually, uh, Liam Neeson was the choice really? for Lincoln for almost all of the pre-production process. And it wasn't until like, the end that they put him in after Liam Neeson huh. couldn't do it. Which I think... I, I think, mean, I, if you're talking about a step down, it's definitely not. Yeah, I would say, if anything, it might be a step up. I think I, it's probably. I like Liam Neeson quite a bit, but, you know. Daniel Day Lewis. Daniel Day Lewis is arguably the best actor currently alive, yeah, if yeah. you would ask me. Like, yeah. I love him. I think he knocks it out of the park. I know yeah. some people who are uh, not impressed with the film so far, and they're kind of underwhelmed by it. And I'll admit the trailer is kind of meh. Like it's not it's not a huge selling point. The but trailer seems to be less selling the film and more just saying, "Look at how awesome and accurate it is about yeah. Lincoln." Which and it's supposed, to be, it's yeah. supposed to be very accurate. It's supposed to be very accurate. But you know, needless to say, supporting cast that the crazy cast and too. crew is amazing. You know, you got people like uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Tommy Lee Jones, and John Hawks involved. Wow. But even beyond that, there's some fucking actors I love that are not big people yeah. necessarily. Jackie or Haley, uh-huh. love him. Yeah. Uh, Walter Goggins, uh-huh. love him. Lee Pace, Pace yep. love him. I mean, and that's Lee just Pace. like the people before even cut Who's off. Who's Pace paying, by the way? Playing. Fernando Wood. Oh, okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I just I love so many of these people yeah. involved that it just it seems like a slam dunk to me. I almost would write in Daniel Day Lewis as a surefire best actor nominee. Oh, he, he should. But like, I I, I I would love to stuff this down people's throat and say, look at how good this is. I'm just hoping it's that good. I am going to say it's going to be good because I have a hard time imagining Daniel Day-Lewis, a Pulitzer Award-winning historian, and Steven Spielberg working on something that sucks. That's my that's my impression, too. Maybe maybe we here at the MacGuffin are wrong and, you know, put bets in the wrong place, but I would say that's a pretty sure one. That's what Go I'm, to Vegas, that's I'm going. Go to Vegas, double book down. It. Yeah, I would book it. So, you no. Know. Let us know your thoughts on that one, and join us next time for our DVD picks for the week of November 13th. Yes. And as always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, mm-hmm. Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, Quite. phone number 323-761-9842, we're on Blip.tv, iTunes, Miro, Roku. You can check in and get glue, and get those weird badges, and get all sticky. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it <laughs> back again, yeah. I waited just for yeah. Spencer. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to buy the side. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight.
can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.